this address has given me more headaches than any other that I have addressed in the last four decades. Not that I do not know what to say. There are certain things that are emotionally disturbing. And when you come to my age, you don't have complete control over your emotions. And if I stop talking, it's not that I don't know what to say, but that I've got a block. Uh, I was not sure how much to cover. First, why get involved at all? It is an internal affair. No, it's not. The violation of human rights is not an internal affair of that country. That is why we got involved in apartheid South Africa, which is a very much an internal affair of South Africa. Secondly, that the fallout on these countries in the way of asylum seekers and refugees. And thirdly, when the chaos is over, the rebuilding of this country will fall on us as happened with East Timor. That is why we should get involved. Uh, that is what I wanted to speak about. There's no way I can cover that. Just, it's impossible. I've tried and tried and tried for hours and hours and hours, including the six hours coming to birth. There's just no way I can do it. I can superficially cross over it. And the only good news I can say is that I'll refer to it and probably get my wife to record a proper recording, which will take an hour and a half. I'm not going to go through all this because I'm going to deal with each of these However, briefly, you know, Sri Lanka, you know all this, or you should. Jaffna, in the north, where the Tamils live, in the north and the east, the Tamil Elam, I'll make a comment about Elam in a minute, and the Colombo here in the yellow area, single area, the area that I come from, about 25 kilometers from Colombo. Uh, the single east, 74% of the country, one of which is myself. Uh, the Tamils in two ethnic groups, the Sri Lankan Tamils who have been in the country for as long as the Sinhalese, two and a half thousand years, and on archaeological evidence, several thousand years before the Sinhalese ever sighted that place. Archaeological evidence is from my uh, cousin of mine, uh, the professor of archaeology, uh, Siraj Dernevala. Plantation, the Tamils are in two groups, the Sri Lankan Tamils and the Plantation Tamils. Plantation Tamils indentured labour brought by the British as, uh, to work on the tea plantations. The Moors, of course, uh, are descendants of the Arab traders 13th to 16th century. Singhali speak the Singhala language and Aryan language. The Tamils speak a Dravidian language. The Moors are bilingual. Most of them speak Tamil. In addition to the ethnic and cultural differences, the difference in religion that most of the Sinhalese, including my mother, are Buddhists. Uh, Tamils are Hindu, 7% having converted to Christianity, uh, one of which myself and the Muslims follow Islam. Now, it is clearly a multi ethnic, multi religious, multilingual, multicultural country. That beyond any doubt. Despite which, the agenda of the Sri Lankan government, the first thing that I want to deal with, is to make it a single Buddhist nation. Right. So what? The question is, what do you do with the Tamils? You want to make it into a single Buddhist country, you've got to do something with the Tamils, 18% of the country. Well, you have to do one of four things. One, you can drive them out of the country to eat some of the people sitting here. But unfortunately, there are still some left. So what do you make out of them? But what can you do to them? Well, you can make them non-people, and I'll show you some of these non-people in a minute. You can make them disappear. The highest rate of disappearances in the world today, I'll show you the evidence in a minute, is Sri Lanka. Or you can jail them, take them into illegal detention centers and keep them forever. Or you can kill them. That, in my book, is genocide. Not genocide, according to Branson, but the, but the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of Crime of Genocide which say that it is an act committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part of national, ethnic, racial or religious groups. Genocide has nothing to do with the numbers scheduled with 550, 500, 5,000 or as Mr. Hitler decided, 6 million and a half. 
the part that the Tamazain world are the part that lives in the north and the east. It is the intention of the act to take that incentive to fruition that constitutes genocide. Bombing and shooting is not the only way to kill, it is very effective. Uh, you can of course starve them, you can withhold essential medicines, you can prevent survival activities, fishing, agriculture, you can destroy their businesses, hospitals, homes, markets, schools, all of them have been recorded in my DVDs. Once the intention is there to achieve genocide, the ways of doing so are endless. You can kill them on mass, as occurred in 2009, the first five months, or deal with that minute, or you can slowly kill them, as is happening today. All of this without witnesses, to we'll deal with that. There are different types of genocide, physical genocide, educational genocide, cultural, economic and religious genocide. All of them. The government of Sri Lanka is responsible for every one of them. The killing started in July 2006. Mahindra Rajapaksa was elected in November 2005 and ended on the 19th or 20th or something of May 2009. Those are the areas that were first Shell, Manal, Chikamali, Batikalo, and then one in the north. All of that is recorded in this DVD. I'm coming here to sell JV, you can take the blaster thing for free. I get enough money uh, swindling the NHS seeing patients. <laughs> uh, 12th of September 2008 is a crucial day in world history. It's the only day that I know of in any country in the world where all humanitarian workers, including the UN, were removed from the conflict zone by the government. No other country do I know it. And they remain excluded to this day, peace or no peace. Then started the slaughter, genocide without witnesses. And this particular DVD, Sri Lanka, genocide crimes against humanity and violation of international law, will cover that in detail. UK Channel 4 video is great. You see sections of it. But the big problem about that is that there are no introductory comments as to who the Tamils are, who the Sinhalese are. And without that, you're lost. If you just want to see murder, for God's sake, you can see it anywhere. Uh, just, just killing here, killing there. So what big deal? How many were killed? God only knows. No one did the counting. They say 40,000 plus in the first five months of 2009 alone. But 146,600 are missing. According to the Bishop of uh, Mena, and I wrote a book about this gentleman, which is at the back somewhere there, this one, because he is up for assassination himself. I don't know if they will save him, but they'll try. 300,000 were sent into welfare villages, according to me, concentration camps. That is the devastation of the North and the East. As the UN Secretary General's advisory panel says, extermination, that is not my word. That is their word. Darusman, attack. Anti-conversion bill, the interesting bill, 2008. It's a, the bill to prevent the forcible conversion. And my comment is that I'm a Christian, and I say that 70% of the country are Buddhists. And Christianity is such a threat that it has to be basically outlawed. <coughs> then there are the irreligious persons bill. The law against irreligious persons. I'm not quite sure what an irreligious person is. What about religious persons who victimize women and children? And all I can comment is to say that Sri Lanka is becoming crazier and crazier. <laughs> but the end result of the game is a pure single Buddhist country. There are no place for the non Sinhalese, Tamils, and Muslims. There's a place for me. But there's no place for non Buddhists such as Hindus, Christians, and me, or Islamists. What about this lessons learnt and reconciliation commission, LLRC? Let me tell you in a summary that the Sri Lankan government has learnt no lessons and there is no reconciliation. There's a large paper, fast paper by me, on why national reconciliation is not possible. It's on the net. I'll tell you where. I'll tell you right now. It's in a blog thing. I don't know what a blog is, but there is a blog. 
called uh, brand Sen brand dot Seniratna blogspot dot com or something like that. It's on my card. I'm not advertising it. Uh, it's all there. All this stuff is there. But on the right, there are some beautiful photographs taken by me. Look at those. That's of Broken Hill and Valley Spring and all that. Very nice. Uh, the lessons learned and reconciliation commission. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the International Crisis Group were invited to watch the human the lessons learned, and they declared said that it does not meet the minimum international standards for a commission of inquiry. They ended the commission is nothing more than a cynical attempt by Sri Lanka to avoid serious inquiry that would bring genuine accountability. They went on. Amnesty International urges the international community not to be deceived by the LLRC, the latest of a long line of failed domestic mechanisms in Sri Lanka. The latest that, uh, that will develop, deliver justice, truth and reparations. It calls for the UN to immediately establish an independent international investigation uh, and it goes on to state why this should be so. Disappearances. There's a 221 page report, a massive report, if ever there was one, by Human Rights Watch in 2008. Disappearances by security forces, a national crisis, recurring nightmare, the state's responsibility for disappearances and abductions. Well, that was 2008. 2012, the situation is worse. Here's the submission which is going in two months time to the Universal Periodic Review, October and November 2012, by International Amnesty International. And it says, and I'll show you the exact quote, the reconciliation is at crossroads, continuing impunity, arbitrary det detention, torture and enforced disappearances. Disappearances 2012, and I quote from the Amnesty report, that Amnesty continues to receive reports of enforced disappearances, including activists protesting against the Sri Lankan government. That's, I think, on the net. Then come the Asian Human Rights Commission, a couple of days ago, 30th of August, was the International Day for the Victims of Enforced Disappearances. And it wrote an article, Sri Lanka enforced disappearances have become a permanent weapon in the arsenal of suppression of dissent. Sri Lanka had the highest number of unresolved disappearances reported to the UN Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances. That repeated request by this international body to visit Sri Lanka over four years has been consistently not replied to. ICRC came up with a report, the Annual General Report 2012, published a couple of days ago, weeks ago I think, they were trying to trace 15,700 people up to the end of last year who have disappeared. The vast majority are Tamils, most of them, uh, uh, sorry, males, most of them are Tamils. There are 1,500 children who have disappeared and 750 women. And of this 15,000, they have found 136. I was going to deal with our own disappeared, but I'm not going to for lack of time. Dimutu Artigala, an Australian citizen, abducted uh, on the 6th of April in the middle of Colombo. Uh, I'm not going to deal with her because she'll be up here. Prem Kumar Gunratnam, another, this girl incidentally, is a leader of the Frontline Socialist Party, a tiny Sri Lankan opposition party. Gunratnam, Another member, uh, with increasing protests, he was docked by the roadside uh, and deported to Australia. They were freed because of pressure from the Australian government through the Canberra, uh, from Canberra on uh, the Australian government concert in Colombo. Those who had no Australian citizenship were not so lucky. A couple of them from the same party have disappeared and remain disappeared. Pradeep Mcnini Kodia, single is like myself, journalist. You heard the number of journalists who have disappeared. Today, Sri Lanka is probably the second 
most dangerous place for independent journalists. The spate of disappearances is brazen and frequent. There were 56 disappearance abductions even when the UN was sitting, the UN Human Rights Council meeting, for God's sake, in February and March, discussing disappearance during those three weeks. 20, 29 people are abducted in Crown. Uh, you ask the Sri Lankan government, government, they say, no, 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 no one has disappeared. They have just left the country. Uh, Dr. Sandra, where is your evidence that they have dis disappeared? I don't have any. That's right, I tell you, you are a tenor, tiger terrorist. Mm -hmm. The fact that my cousin was the previous president and a patriot makes it genetically impossible. One can't be a patriot and the other a tenor, tiger terrorist. Genetics doesn't work that way. <laughs> Torture. This is the Amnesty International presentation on torture, committee against torture. Perhaps the most shocking aspect of the criminal justice system is the overwhelmingly large number of charges which are fabricated by the police on a daily basis. <clears throat> so when you send people back to Sri Lanka, you are sending them back to be tortured. There is no follow-up. If you are happy doing that, what are the realities on the ground? The North and East is under permanent military control and will be for the foreseeable future. The military are everywhere, involved in all activities, civilian, commercial, administrative, the lot. The Tamils are the spoils of war. We can do what the hell we want with them and their land, including rent them with no accountability. The singleization of the Tamil areas we, to replace the Singhalese, by replace the Tamils with Singhalese, to destroy the concept of a Tamil homeland. Sri Lanka is up for sale. You Tamils, most of you fellows have got pocket loads of money, and I am the whole person who married the only Tamil without any money. <laughs> My wife. <laughs> Sri Lanka is up for sale, so if you guys want to put some money together and buy the place up, you are very welcome. China, India and there are other buyers too. I'm afraid I don't have enough time to go into this because we already got down to 15 minutes and I've got like, oh, we'll have a lot to cover. Uh, but basically, it's militarization, <coughs> the military involved in economic activities, the loss of livelihood of Tamils, I'll show you that in a minute, resettlement which is a farce. The singleization, eviction, land grabs, and Buddhistization, a new word, making Hindus into Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka says it's fine. We've got happy, smiling faces, coming faces, at long last, freed from the terrorism of the LTT. The others have a different view. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and ICG and the UN Secretary General say that it's a humanitarian crisis. My question to the Sri Lankan government is, well, if there are happy smiling faces, why don't you let us go in, especially Amnesty, and see these happy smiling faces? Here's the evidence, and all of these have been printed by me a couple of days ago, and they're on the back there. The UN Secretary General's report was too big for me to print. Um, <clears throat> it's got 200 and 199 pages, so I printed the abstract on the damning indictment of Sri Lanka, if ever there was one. The situation report in the Tamil North and the East, this thing, outstanding report by Sumantaran from the Tamil National Alliance. Uh, he showed exactly what was going on, and there have been many, many confirmatory reports after that. Bishop Ram Jola, that thing that I just showed you, this, the copy is there, at the back, his submission to the LLRC is well worth reading. This is a man on the ground man. I don't think that he's alive. International Crisis Group published bucket loads of stuff, and so has Amnesty International. All of these are back there. What do these reports say? Well, it says that the Sri Lankan government is lying. In single is Borukiano. It has no intention of addressing the problems faced by the Tamils. The government of Sri Lanka says this is an internal affair which we can fix, to which we say there is no evidence that you have. 
Well then, what about the UN? The only comment that I can make is, oh, so that's what we could do. The UN Human Rights Council in May 2009, after the end of the conflict, passed a resolution that this is a domestic matter that does not warrant outside intervention. Amnesty has different views on this. It condemned the resolution saying it abandoned hundreds of thousands of people in Sri Lanka to the cynical political considerations. In March 2012, they passed another resolution with the Tamils are jumping up and down and saying, Why we won? Crap. The resolution they passed, the US sponsored resolution, has done even more damage. It has given the Sri Lankan government one year to do what it is doing and implement the flawed LLRC report. Well, by that time, the troubles in the North and the East may very well truly be finished. And uh, then, of course, there will be no problem. So, problem fixed. Bishop Rabbi Joseph, I know that I've got time for all this, uh, is very, very important, really. Uh, he said that he warned the US envoys who came to Sri Lanka before they went to the UN. Two of them, Robert Blake and some Otari or something. Any resolution coming out of the UN Council, Human Rights Council, which gives more time to the Sri Lankan government will have a devastating impact on the Tamil community. <coughs> the government's current activities will mean that if they are given more time, they will play havoc in the North and the East and subjugate the interests and aspirations of the Tamil people. His full report is in that book. And he ends up by saying, if the international community does not act now, like it did not in May 2009, the Tamils will cease to be a people in the country that's genocide. Here the evidence, the Tamils in the north and the east are slowly dying. UN Secretary General's report, as I told you, talks of extermination. I've got a bit of an emotional problem at this point because in my previous work I was a zoologist and I worked with these people. I lived with these people, they looked after me for about a week here and in Trikumani. Let's take you to Mulikula. This has got a rich history of 250 years. There were 400 tunnels fishing and agriculture in that corner, which is about half empty of Mena and uh, Jephna. They were asked in 19, 2007 to leave for a couple of days. You'll be back. Don't worry. You just just pick your things. Your worthy or whatever the thing is. And uh, just leave. You, you'll be back. Don't worry. Five years later, they're still not there. So let me take you hand in hand to Mulikola. But you can't drive there. You have to find the place. This is where the people of Mulikola have been relocated. Welcome to my home. That's home. You can't see. It. That's from their fault. It is there. The little black thing there. That's home. Oh, it's time to cook. Yeah, that's easy enough. Light the fire and cook. The kitchen, that's nothing. No electricity is over. Light a fire and put a couple of rocks together, but they have been done that for years. What's the difference? Oh, uh, time to eat. There's no dining table. There is a table, I'll show you. But why you have a dining table you can eat on your lap? Oh, time to wash up. Whether there's a washing group, so you wash on the spot. And uh, water is delivered to the door, so that you've got to catch the bloody thing. Um, laundry is right on the corner, and wash everything and just hang it up on a tree. But there is a table of sorts, there you are. Uh, not for eating. Visitors have arrived a Roman Catholic priest, a Buddhist monk, and two NGOs. They were shocked. The Buddhist monk said, A Buddhist monk, my dear said, what have these people done to deserve this? I'm not making it up, it's published, and I'll show you where it is published. 
I've got the publication out there. All the time you relax, you can lean on that tree, but you can't cut a tree because it's government property. It's time to read. You've got one paper, you can read it over and over and over again. I'm sure you know the backwards. Um, or just, just hanging around. Nothing. And that's what he's hanging around. Time to sleep? Well, just sleep. Elephant, snakes, the lot. How do I know it? Well, I've been there. And I've slept in their huts. They saved me from being trapped by the elephants. Can't even go to church because of the fear that God might intervene. <laughs> the people are not permitted to attend the church in Mulekola <coughs> and participate in private or community prayers. They are only allowed to visit the church at spe times specified by the military under an escort by the military. Even prayers and services in the church take place under strict military supervision. 2012, a priest there has, was allowed to have the first communion mass. Big deal. Let's go to the north. I've been all, I've been all over the place man. as a biologist collecting specimens. So I know this part of the world better than most of you guys do. Resettlement of Tamils is a fast. That is resettlement. To move that sheet aside and for a single is tough as a uniform or not uniform. <coughs> Get in there, <coughs> drag the people out and break them. It's common. I've got a publication coming up in a week's time. An epidemic of rape of Tamil women and girls in the north and east by the security forces and the signal is relocated in the area. It's a major, major problem. There you are. 200,000 people living like this in the northern jungles. That is rehabilitation. Here you are, secure their dwellings, for sure. Or you can be resettled in a drain. I was too tired, but I got a, uh, 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 a slide which shows what happens in the rainy season. Uh, the latrines are pit latrines, and uh, when the rains come, the water overflows into the latrines, and the feces comes into uh, the tents. Let's go to the northeast, Trikamali. <coughs> I've been there. I visited this area to collect specimens. Particularly in Sampur. Same again, I've got the picture, I've got no time to show it to you. India is building a coal powered fire, uh, coal power, powered um, electricity plant. 500 homes have been bulldozed. And we ask, what about the people? Government of Sri Lanka says, what do you ask? I said, well, people. I said, well, we relocated them. And free. We didn't charge them for relocation. Thousands, secondary settlers. They are quite good actually, compared to the whole that you just see. Yeah, they are actually quite nice. I don't mind them one doing myself. This is the Buddhistization of erecting Buddhist statues where Hindu temples were. Mr. Singh Bhumi for the military. This is the Market Salo. Uh, 9th Regiment, Sri Lanka Signal Corps in Irunamadu, in Kirnachi. Food is being used as a weapon. It is recognizing international law that this is genocide. These are child not out of Biafra, out of Jaffa. 75% of the children are Melanized. The doctor of medicine, I can tell you that that pot belly is quashier core development. Child will be dead. It is a violation of the Geneva Convention, Article 55 and 56 of the 4th Geneva Convention, that say that an occupying power, the Sri Lankan army, had the duty of ensuring adequate food and medical supplies in the area of occupation within the northern leagues. It's a totalitarian regime run by one family. Rajapaksa. But I will also talk about that people are happy. They love us. 
The executive powers that Sri Lanka president, no president anywhere in the world has the powers that this man has. And these have been enhanced by the 18th Amendment of the Constitution. They are the piece by me on the Constitution of Sri Lanka, the thing that says, I don't know what it's called, but uh, it says the current situation or something. The last half is on the Constitution of Sri Lanka. I've got more time to go into this in detail. Here's the man. He's the first president that I know of, including my mother cousin, who genuinely believes that Sri Lanka is a single Buddhist country. He is the commander in chief of the armed forces, the executive president of the Ministry of Defense. He says, I don't care who what the world thinks. And his brother says, Terrorism, you guys should be crushed. I'll do it in three years. He did it less. This is the gentleman, Mr. Gotabi Rajapaksa, the president's brother. Oh, we've got a problem here. Uh, he is actually uh, the equivalent of Mr. Goebbels, PhD, who perfected Mr. Hitler's The Big Lie, that if a lie is audacious enough and repeated enough times, it will be believed by the masses, that is us and the rest of the world. Now, there is a bit of a problem because Sri Lanka has two presidents, I know you noticed it. There is an elected one, this gentleman on the right, and a de facto one, the gentleman on the right, on the left. So, Mr. Gotabe Rajapaksa, Defense Secretary, is not Defense Secretary, that's a public servant. He is the de facto president of Sri Lanka. Have I got evidence? Of course I have. One thing about the singer is they do their homework. <laughs> With mounting evidence, here the proof, the international community devolved power to the Tamil North and the East. President, in quotes, Mahindra Rajapaksa, initiated the All-Party Representative Council, APRC, to look into a constitutional settlement. APRC lived along for three years and uh, submitted a report which was now published, which was shared. With increasing pressure, particularly from India, to devolve some power to the Tamil areas, they started another committee, Parliamentary Select Committee, to devolve power to the Tamil areas. In stepped the real president. In an interview on the 16th of August 2012, he said, and I quote, this is to the uh, India headlines today, the existing constitution is more than enough. Devolution wise, I think we have done enough. I don't think there's any necessity to go beyond that. And it stopped right there. I'm doing an analysis, a bit periodical analysis, it may sound like a joke, it's not. Uh, I think this man, gentlemen, has a psychiatric disorder or a major personality disorder. And uh, you, you know, to call him that uh, he's, uh, uh, he's an asshole, that's not a diagnosis. I mean, he's got one, but he is not one. Medically, I can tell you that. Or he's a machine you know, told or something. Those, those are crude words. You got to analyze him medically. Uh, and he, when he told Frederica Jans that you are an effing, he didn't say effing, he said the full word. Big uh, who he check, 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 check journalists. I can bring a puppy or an elephant if I choose. I'm not afraid of the bloody courts. I can put you in jail. These are what in medical terms are called delusions of grandeur and outbursts of rage. Um, why he wants to bring a puppy and an elephant to Sri Lanka, I have no idea. I mean, if he said hippopotamus, uh, I would have accepted it. I mean, he wanted that. Uh, there is a, I mean, I'm not talking as a doctor, I'm not uh, joking. There is an intermittent explosive disorder uh, which has just been published uh, by the University of Chicago. And uh, that, I think, fits this gentleman perfectly. That uh, analysis of this brother, what's up, will be on the next. <laughs> then comes uh, <laughs> my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Fonseca, who in an interview in 2008 to the Toronto Globe and Mail said, and I quote, I strongly believe that this country belongs to the Sinhalese, but the Arab minority community, that you guys, we are, but we being the majority, we, we have a right to protect this country from who? From you not. They, you, can live with us, but not us from trying under the pretext of being a minority. Not a pretext, you are a minority. Do you demand undue things? And what are these undue things? Not to be removed, etc. He now says, this gentleman must be charged, right? Mm. But to throw him into jail on a trumped up charge is not right. You can't do that. 
Rajabaksa can, but we oppose it. And I oppose the imprisonment of uh, Fonseca, totally. He should be charged before the International Criminal Court. He now says, what do you think he says? Uh, he says he has been misunderstood. Ah, he is wrong. 20th of July 2012, he said he was misunderstood. And he hopes that someday Sri Lanka will have a tablet with him. <laughs> you know, these guys are the most, uh, I don't know. There's a crisis in democracy and governance. I've got no time to go into this. But I'll do something probably for you. Um, all of these facets are met. We've done the whole lot. I advise you to buy a book called The End of America by Naomi Wolf, who says that the 10 steps in the establishment of fascism, they're all men, every single one of them have been met in Sri Lanka. The economy is in trouble, these 10 people. The budgetary estimate for 2012, the income is $1 trillion. The expected expenditure is $2.2 trillion. The budget deficit of one trillion. How do you mean that? Taxation, foreign and local borrowings, social welfare cuts, and the imposition of even greater burdens on the struggling taxpayer and the poor. And as a member of the left, they have disturbed me greatly. The public debt has topped five trillion. Where does the money go? To the Minister of Defence and Urban Development. How did urban development become defense? God only knows. Asked uh, what happened. 230 billion. What about health? 77 billion. Education? 33 billion. And for the Ministry of Reconstruction, 0.5 billion. This massive military expenditure is to sustain an army which in water was 170,000 uh, and now is 230 with a call to increase it to 300,000. Um, international Games, running out of time, so I'll have to rush it. This is critically important to appreciate this. I don't think the ITT did appreciate it. If oil is the problem in the Middle East, then Sri Lanka's geopolitical position across the Indian Ocean is the problem. Indian Ocean is not the largest ocean on Earth, but it's by far the most economically active uh, ocean. Forty percent of the world's oil production is in countries around the Indian Ocean. It carries seventy percent of the oil shipments and fifty percent of the world's container cargo. Admiral Mahan said a hundred years ago, whoever controls the Indian Ocean dominates Asia. And that is the name of the game. That is the name of the game. China, China's string of pearls round to safeguard the oil supply to China and the manufactured goods outside. That is why one of the largest harbors in South Asia is in Hambantota, Rajapaksa's village. There are two wars going on here. The single government trying to force the Tamils to accept Sri Lanka as a single Buddhist country. A war at a high level, the US, China versus India. It's a funny war. It's they're cooperating with each other to keep Rajapaksa in power and competing with each other to get into Sri Lanka first. A new word that we call, coin which I have coined as competing. That's competing and cooperating. Uh, colonialism today takes the form of foreign aid. We asked for 1.6 billion US dollars from the IMF. IMF gave us 2.6. <coughs> Asylum seekers. Uh, that's what you were interested in. There are the the global asylum uh, refugee problem, 42 million refugees. Uh, one point, one person in 115 on the planet is a refugee. These are the major refugee takers. Pakistan, Syria, Australia, nowhere near. <laughs> Australia is a generous take of refugees. Bullshit. <laughs> These are total mills. Boat arrivals, total refugees, they are. Boat arrivals are there. I didn't cook up these figures, you know. I don't need to cook it up, the reality. Refugees cost us greatly. Don't talk nonsense. 
uh, it is mandatory detention, but that costs us greatly. I don't know, as Buck says. Border protection is highly expensive. Oh God. Come on. $104 a day for mandatory detention. A humane policy that welcomed and helped refugees would cost us far less. <coughs> uh, Honorable Mr. Wainwright is looking at me nervously. About to finish. Australia has been inundated with people in boats. Gosh. 95, most of the illegal <coughs> entrants into Australia are visa overstays, except that they are white. Numbers coming to Australia are higher than any other country. Crap! Of the 42 million people, 88,000 applied for asylum. Only 4,000 of these applied to Australia. You can have a copy of the slide if you like, if it helps you. Australia receives more refugees than any other country. Nonsense! The asylum seekers worldwide have increased significantly over the past. Yeah, for sure they have in other countries. <coughs> Asylum, Australia takes more asylum seekers than ever before. Despite the increase in the people seeking asylum, Australia still takes fewer asylum seekers than it did in 2001. The boats uh, have stopped coming because have started coming because of a softening of asylum seeker policy in Australia. That is not true. I give you the reason. You can read it at your leisure. Temporary protection visas and Pacific solutions stop the boats. Absolutely not true. Um, people are illegally coming to Australia to seek refuge. To seek refuge and asylum has never been illegal in any country on any part of the world. It is the right on Australian law, that's on international law, to seek asylum. Here they are. That's the official. Entry. Oh, you try to get there. Say, no, 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 no. The front door. Go to the front door. Front door. Is. So you contact a asylum seeker. Most asylum seekers come by boat. Johnsons. They fly in by plane. And visa overstay. Uh, there are terrorists on the boat. LTT terrorists. May I remind you that on international law. There is a thing called body combat. Even if you were an LTT fighter and you laid down your law on out of combat, you have even a greater protection. India or some other country should take the asylum seekers. Not true. None of these countries are asylum. The asylum seeker policy. I'm afraid at that point I really have to push on and say what can be done, and I'll take five minutes. Uh, uh, I really can't uh, finish that one. <laughs> I have to put this. Uh, Australia is a Christian country. <laughs> Excuse me why I laugh. It is the most unchristian like Christian who disregards the when I was homeless you gave me in, uh, took me in provision. When the boats, people coming in have a brown skin. That is why I don't go to church in Australia anymore. Prime Minister Rudd, he was a Prime Minister, he is my local member of Parliament. I left him a note on his table. Mr. Wright, the problem is not in Jakarta, it's in Kalamu. <laughs> Mr. Cairo's, Obama's Cairo speech, there is one truth that lies at the heart of every religion, that you do unto others, that we would have them do unto us. The world is a better place for all of us to live in. We know how to share the world. What can you do? And I'll be finished in five minutes, three minutes, four minutes. Firstly, I don't know. What, what, are, what are your concerns? You say you're going to do something, right? Tell me your concerns. What are you concerned about? For whose benefit are you doing all this? Do you appreciate the difficulty? Have you got a strategy to address these difficulties and the power to do so? Concerns. Alright, you are interested in the humanitarian concerns. 
right? Okay. In that case, you get the experts in this area into the game. The immediate ambition of Amnesty International Human Rights Watch and the International Crisis Group. Now, the war is over, there is peace, smiling coming faces, there is no justification for keeping these people out. Long term, the future of the Tamil people, I'll just criticize in a minute. Oh, well, I suppose that's, that's a reasonable enough concern. Asylum seekers, and you've got to just a push factor which I just showed you. Dispatching of democracy, that is a problem for the Sinhalese. They are happy to live in a tyrannical state, but I suppose that's the reality. For whose benefit are we doing all this? For the Tamil people. Well, what do they want? Well, let's ask them. Let's have a referendum in the North and the East under UN supervision, as we did in East Timor. And the right of self determination, the same right on which we got independence from colonial British. We are not trying to reinvent the wheel. The difficulty you say, what difficulties are you going to face? One, a ruthless regime drunk with power that has got one aim to make Sri Lanka into a single Buddhist nation and to remain in power forever. <clears throat> Second difficulty is going to be a regime backed by China, India, the US and the International Monetary Fund for their own geopolitical and capitalist gains. You've got a useless, toothless US, UN uh, <laughs> coffee club. A useless, toothless opposition including most many of the leading Tamil politicians in Sri Lanka. I'm cautious. I have been cautious about this because I'm a Sinhalese. But I, I've come to the conclusion that if I have to say something, I'll say it whether I'm a Sinhalese in Tamil or Tamil. Anyway. There's, Tamils are a voiceless lot in Sri Lanka. They've got no voice. The highly successful disinformation campaign by the Sri Lankan government in the Sinhala South, my people do not know what is going on in the North and internationally. And a fragmented, despondent, expected Tamil community, 1.1 million of them, who are doing nothing but fighting amongst themselves or perceiving or getting into a state of apathy or ego boosting. Have you any strategies to address this? Have you got any strategies? Who is you? You the Tamils? I regret to say no. You the rest of us? Or simply, God only knows. I don't know. We we'll say, we we'll wait and see. What has to be done? You've got to legitimize the Tamil struggle and show that this is an oppressed people who require liberation from the central government in Karakul. That this is not an exercise in terms of. You need an information blitz in the Sinhala South and internationally. Have you done that? No. Have you got the material to do it? Yes, for God's sake, I've got 11 DVDs spread out here. <laughs> All you need is subtitles in Sinhalese. Can I do it? No. Because I've got no contacts in Sinhala South. The real problem is a lack of appreciation, it's not that the material is not available, a lack of appreciation among the Tamils. The ruthlessness of the Sri Lankan government to prevent any of this from getting to Sri Lanka and the disinterested media abroad. Leave it to the UN to sort out. This is exercising futility. Leave it to the politicians in Sri Lanka and abroad. They, they have settled it, but they haven't. If they could, we wouldn't be in the mess that we are. Restart the armed struggle. One of the worst and most dangerous things you can say. International Crisis Group said this a couple of years ago. I came with them and said, God say, don't say that. Because it will justify the increase in the armed forces. You can't, you never can have an armed confrontation with the Sri Lankan government. It will be crushed. It's simply a new struggle. Yes, very much so. We need a, not a single and a Tamil struggle. We need a struggle of the people against an oppressive regime that yesterday turned the guns on the Tamils and today and tomorrow will turn the guns on the Sinhalese and it's already happening. We need to link hands across the ethnic divide. Who will lead this struggle? The people. Tamil civil society. Tamil civil society has already got going. The submission to the UN Human Rights Council is already there. Friday Forum, a group of 
non-political people led by Jayatan Anapala, who should have been the UN Secretary General, had not Raja Paksa uh, uh, interfered. Jayatan Anapala and Samitra Gurusekar, a professor of law, wrote a scathing article, The Arrogance of Power, a Plane, a Pilot, and a Puppy. And it's on the net. It's one of the most damning articles ever. <coughs> the genuine left, Vijay Das from the Socialist Equality Party, Sinjo Gajasuri from the United Socialist Party and Dr. Vikramabhav Karnaratna from the Navasama Samaj Party. I'm a member of all of these. <laughs> they can mobilize the people. Regime change, you're talking nonsense. The Arab Spring will have an Asian Spring. To have any spring of any sort, you need the support of the people. And you haven't even got anywhere near that. My paper on what happened, Rajapak said that, uh, you know, you fucking shit thing, uh, it has all the details of why this is impossible. The big stick approach. Do what you did with South Africa. I went there with Desmond, Desmond Tutu some time ago, talking to him, and he arranged for me to see the ANC leaders. I said, what helped? There are only two things left. Number one, the trade boycott, and two, cricket. That's all. All your resolutions, they were through the window. And they should know. Uh, need I spell out what we did with South Africa? I don't think so. You isolate the regime, boycott, blocks, etc. You drag the criminals, both government and the TTE, and the XL TTE. Now we made this drag the government to the International Criminal Court. And what happened to Mr. Charles Taylor? The Liberian head of state a few days ago should give you heart. He was sentenced to 50 years in jail by the ICC, the Sudanese president, Sibila. <coughs> what about Tamilia? Yep, I have been a supporter of Tamilia from the time I was 10 years old. When I first went to the north and the east, just for the first time, I crossed Waunia. And my parents, one of them, the Nephew of Sir Solomon Das Pardal Nayaka, KCMG, my father sitting in the back, and the other, the capitalist brother, hmm. capitalist sister of a Marxist brother in the Samarapoli. And I said, until this area is separated from the single assault, this area will never develop. He said, that is Marxism talking, that's your uncle talking. I said, that is not Marxism, that is the cold blue capital reforms of 1833 that I've got to reverse. However much a supporter of either I am, I never mention the word when I'm uh, uh, lobbying for the international community, particularly once. I talk of the reversal of the Gold Brook Cabinet. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Three kingdoms, Gold Brook Cabinet reforms, made three to one and centralized power in Kamal. That is what <laughs> has got to be reversed. This is a critically important slide, which unfortunately I don't have time to uh, discuss, but it's discussed in my various DVDs. That is Colombo, pre-conflict when I was growing up. That, that is Jaffna, pre-conflict. There's a difference in there. Yes, there is. That's what the struggle is all about. Centralization of power in Colombo has got to be reversed. If there's ever going to be peace and prosperity in Sri Lanka. That is Colombo now, but the tourists see, that is Jaffna. Sri Lanka is too small to be divided. Crap. The single estate, 18,000 square miles, is larger than 63 UN nations. And the Tamil state, 7,300 square miles, is larger than 38 UN nations. 30 times larger than Sri Lanka. Mr. Barack Obama says that the only solution to the Israeli Palestine uh, conflict is a separate Palestine state. Well, Mr. Obama, do your homework. Sri Lanka, 25,000 square Kilo, uh, miles, the single estate 18,000, Tamil area 7,000. Israel is, Israel, Palestine is 10,000, Israel 8,000, Palestine 2,000. So the only solution to that is a separate state. Why not to Sri Lanka? Uh, the real reason why you don't want to divide that because the crucial Trikamali Harbor will fall into Tamil hands. That you can't have. That is Trikamali. What about the totalitarian regime? Bad news. Uh, but the good news is that all dictatorships come to an end. Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, Gaddafi, Idi Amin, they have all come and gone. And the Rajapaksa regime will not be an exception. The question is how much damage they are going to do to the Tamils, the Sinhalese, the economy and the country before they go. 
a lot of damage can be done, as Mr. Mugabe has shown. That is, Kalambo wants the tourists see. That's Jaffna which the tourists do not see. You know, the Sri Lanka flag says it all. Here is it, here's my land, thrown in hand, threatening you guys, the Tamils and the Muslims. That says it all in a nutshell. Genocide in Sri Lanka. I'm sorry I can't do this book because it's so damn expensive. But this says it all. If this is not genocide, what the hell is it? Thank you very much.